All right, guys, here is part two of the Agriculture Revolution online notes. So we left off last time talking about the grindstone. Now we got to talk about how these farmers expanded their production. So basically how they were able to have more farms and to grow more food. And one way they were able to do it was to reclaim wasteland. We talk about wasteland, we talk about areas that aren't suitable or good for farming. Places like swamps or forests. So what these Europeans started doing was cutting down the forest and draining the swamps and creating new farmland so they can grow more crops. They needed to feed more people so they had to make more land suitable for farming. But by doing this they also had to adopt what's called a three field system or the crop rotation. And this was a better way of helping the land and helping people grow more crops. What we see here is an example of the three field system. We have field A, B, and C. The whole point of this three field system was to basically allow for one field to grow a certain crop, the next field to grow up another, and the third field to grow up another. By doing this, this allowed the fields that were not being in use to kind of sit around and regenerate. Because if you keep farming in the same soil, the soil will go bad. So what you have to do is leave the soil alone and let the nutrients come back into the ground to make the soil fertile once again. And so they learned how to do this and they adopted this three field system as shown here. And here we'll tell you what was grown in each field at what year. And again, this allowed for the soil to come back to its normal level. Another great expansion or great uh, idea that came around this time was something called the trade fairs. These were large markets where goods were basically sold or traded. Think of this as a large flea market, basically. So everyone in town came to this one area where they would bring all their crops that they've grown or their goods they wanted to sell, and they would just set up shop and say, hey, come buy my stuff. These were small trading areas that eventually grew into towns, and these towns started having their own charters and laws. So these large cities in Europe that we know today may have started as small towns or even small trade fairs, and then they grew. Here's a picture example of what a medieval trade fair might have looked like. So right here would be the town center, and here you have the different groups of people opening up their little shops where they trade and sell goods. Around here are all the houses that were built around the shops. So when this place first started out, it was probably just these booths here at first, and eventually people started settling down and creating towns. This next slide are more examples of a trade fair. This is, this is what uh, some people did, what they sold, right here and right here. Not much different than a giant flea market. Another important thing we have to talk about are something called guilds. Now, when you, see, when you hear the word guild, think of it as a club, and it's a club for workers. Here are some examples of what the workers would have been. Stonemasons, which are brick makers. Weavers, which make uh, baskets and so on and so forth. Cloth makers, that's clothing, so on and so forth. So we have these different groups of people right here. These people will come together and create what's called a guild or a club. So it's a club of basket makers, a club of brick makers, a club of blacksmiths or people who make weapons and armor. They'll come together and they'll sit down together and they'll say, okay, how should we sell our goods? What prices should we sell them at? Because this is all about keeping competition very, very low. They don't want to compete with one another. They want everyone to make money. So they'll say, let's all sell these goods at the same price, and they'll all agree upon a price. They'll even pass rules to say how many hours they could work and how the quality of their work or how good their work should be. And not everyone could join the guild. The membership was very limited. You had to actually be really good at your craft to join a guild. Now, an interesting thing is, when these people came and sat down together, they would also say things like, let's make our products a little weaker. So, if we were all blacksmiths, we would make weak swords or armor, so that when these people would buy them, they would break, and then they'd be forced to come back and pay us more money, and we'd keep repairing their stuff. These are some of the things these guilds did. 
to work in a guild, you had to start as an apprentice or someone who was learning how to do a certain trade, like blacksmithing or whatever, and you had to do that for seven years unpaid. But this was important because you learn the trade and you learn how to do that thing to eventually you can set up your own shop and join the guild. And one third of the guilds were exclusive to women and many had both men and women working in them. As we see in this picture, we have blacksmiths and masons or brick makers. You can see in both pictures, there are both men and women working together. Another thing that happened was trade revived. So trade is really important because that's how we get goods and ideas around. And as we can see on this map of Europe, here you see Italy, Spain's right here, England. This map shows us all these different trade routes that developed, all these small towns or cities, and all the routes these traders took to trade their all their goods or even their uh, even farmers could trade their food as well. So trade blew up and expanded during this time. Last thing is how do you get a job in the Middle Ages? Well, you have to become an apprentice first in whatever trade you want to learn, and then eventually when you become good at what you do, you can join the guild and open up your own shop. That's it for the Agricultural Revolution.